albatrosses are able to soar over the oceans for great distances using the energy of the wind. This is known as dynamic soaring and this animation will explain how it works. The flight path of the albatross model is based on film of albatross in flight and on GPS tracking data comprising ground position, velocity and height. The GPS data shows an albatross flying an undulating path, its track changing by plus and minus about 20 to 30 degrees. During the leeward turns, in this case to the right, the bird flies a wing over, a kind of arch turn, trading airspeed for height and back again. The left turns are windward turns. The bird flies close to the surface, taking advantage of ground effect to minimize drag losses. In the wind gradient theory, based on the original proposition of Lord Rayleigh in 1883, the albatross gains airspeed in climbing and descending through the wind gradient and dissipates that airspeed due to aerodynamic drag. Well, there is more to it than that. There are four effects to look at. These are the aerodynamic forces acting on the bird, the effect of acceleration, the effect of the wind gradient, and finally, the transfer of momentum between the bird and the wind. Let's start by looking at the triangle of velocities. Airspeed and heading are calculated using an estimated wind velocity to solve the triangle of velocities at each data point. The red arrow is air velocity, the speed and direction of the bird relative to the air. The blue arrow is wind velocity, the speed and direction of the wind relative to the ground. The green arrow is ground velocity, the speed and direction of the bird relative to the ground. This is the drift angle, the angle between the bird's heading and the ground track, and this is the wind angle, the angle between the bird's heading and the wind direction. In this model, the bird's average heading is assumed to be approximately crosswind, and the wind speed at least half of the bird's airspeed. The wind direction is constant, and the wind speed varies with a slight wind gradient effect. Throughout the leeward turn, the bird accelerates and its ground speed increases. At the same time, the bird's airspeed decreases with a gain of height and increases with a loss of height. But at the beginning and end of each turn, the airspeed is about the same. In the windward turn, its ground speed reduces while it maintains height, but its airspeed is approximately constant. Now, if you think that ground velocity is irrelevant to an aircraft in flight, that would be so for an aircraft in equilibrium. However, the albatross in dynamic soaring is never in equilibrium and is always under acceleration. Ground velocity is simply a way of visualizing that acceleration. Although the bird's ground velocity increases during the leeward turn and reduces during the windward turn, in fact, the GPS data clearly shows that there are times when the bird is gaining both ground speed and height. This acceleration requires a force, and there are only two forces available to a glider, gravity or the aerodynamic force. On average, the albatross maintains height, so it must use a component of the aerodynamic force. Let's look at the forces on a glider. The white arrow is lift, normal to the air velocity. The orange arrow is drag, opposite to the air velocity. Weight is shown in red. In equilibrium, the vector sum of lift and drag, the resultant, equals the weight at constant airspeed and rate of descent. The albatross is said to have the best lift-drag ratio of all birds at about 20 to 1, giving a 3 degree angle of glide. However, in this animation, to make things clearer, the lift-drag ratio is shown as 10 to 1. So now let's see how the aerodynamic forces cause acceleration of ground velocity. Aircraft and birds turn by banking in the direction of turn. The lift vector banks with the bird and there are vertical and horizontal components. The vertical component of lift normally supports the weight of the bird and the horizontal component of lift provides the centripetal force which makes the bird turn. Now let's hide the lift vector and its vertical component and just concentrate on a plan view. Now we can see that the horizontal component of lift in white and the drag in orange are components of the horizontal resultant, the grey arrow. This is the horizontal component of the resultant force 
which was referred to earlier. We can now hide the drag and centripetal forces which were oriented to the air velocity, leaving the horizontal resultant, which can now be resolved into new force components related to the acceleration of ground velocity. The yellow arrow is the force which causes the centripetal acceleration. This gives the bird a curved path over the ground which is different to its path through the air. The purple arrow is the force which gives the tangential acceleration which is seen as the acceleration of ground speed. In the windward turn, the tangential force is retarding and causes the ground speed to reduce. This is because bank and drift are on opposite sides, in this case banking to the left and drifting to the right. In the leeward turn, now banking to the right, we can again see the drag force and the horizontal component of lift combining to form the horizontal resultant. Here is the same horizontal resultant with the ground velocity and now with the ground tangential and ground centripetal forces. This time however the ground tangential force is propulsive and causes the ground speed to increase because the angle of bank is on the same side as the angle of drift. The leeward turn is where the bird is gaining momentum and kinetic energy as ground speed increases. During the windward turn, the retarding force opposite to the direction of the ground velocity causes the bird to lose momentum and energy. During the leeward turn, in the wing over, the bird trades airspeed for height. As the bird pitches up, so too does the propulsive force and extra height is gained even as ground speed increases. The bird is gaining both potential and kinetic energy. When the bird pitches down it will lose height, but the descent is less steep than the climb. The extra height energy is expended any time the bird is losing height, helping to overcome drag or to increase airspeed. The bird gains more energy in the leeward turn than it loses in the windward turn and the difference is equal to its total drag losses. We will return to this point later. Now, while all this acceleration of ground speed is going on, what happens to the airspeed? Normally, in gliding, airspeed is constant due to a balance of forces. Drag is balanced by a component of weight. In dynamic soaring, airspeed is constant due to a balance of accelerations. Because of the wind angle, the airspeed effectively comprises a ground speed component and a wind component, which is either a headwind or a tailwind component. The acceleration of airspeed is the sum of the acceleration of the ground speed component and the acceleration of the wind component. When these two accelerations are equal and opposite, the acceleration of airspeed is theoretically zero, which means airspeed is constant. The acceleration of the wind component depends on the rate of change of the wind angle, which is the same as the bird's rate of turn. The acceleration of the ground speed component depends on aerodynamic forces. Both of these accelerations ultimately depend on the bird's angle of bank. In the steeply banked leeward turn, the bird's rate of turn is relatively quick, causing a decreasing headwind or an increasing tailwind component as the bird turns downwind. The propulsive force accelerates the ground speed to match the decreasing headwind. During the windward turn, the albatross maintains its airspeed by turning towards the wind. The tailwind component decreases or the headwind component increases due to the rate of turn and equals or even slightly exceeds the loss of ground speed caused by the retarding force. The result is that the airspeed is approximately the same at the beginning and end of each turn, although during the wing over the airspeed varies with height. The albatross flies the leeward turn as a wing over. Why not flying ground effect as in the windward turn? The answer is that the propulsive force in the leeward turn has to be greater than the retarding force in the windward turn to enable the bird to gain more energy overall. The leeward turn is shorter and quicker than the windward turn, although the change of ground velocity is the same in each turn. 
The propulsive force depends on a large horizontal component of lift, which can only be achieved by a large angle of bank. To achieve a large angle of bank without high g, the albatross flies a 1g wing over. The vertical component of lift is quite small and is not enough to support the weight of the bird, but a wing over is partly ballistic and gives the bird enough time to complete the turn. To achieve a large angle of bank, the bird must gain some height. So what is the effect of climbing and descending through the wind gradient? The wind gradient is the effect whereby the wind speed reduces with reducing height due to surface friction. When the bird climbs with a headwind gradient and descends with a tailwind gradient, as shown here, the wind gradient will tend to increase the bird's airspeed, while the inertia of the bird will resist a change to its actual speed. However, the bird is never close to an upwind or a downwind heading, so the effect will be quite small. It will merely offset the tendency of airspeed to decrease due to drag, or to gaining height, or to turning downwind. Finally, how does the albatross get the energy from the wind to balance its drag losses? This is achieved by the bird flying differently shaped windward and leeward turns, causing different rates of acceleration. When the bird turns by banking, the horizontal resultant force is caused by giving horizontal momentum to the air in the opposite direction, the light blue arrow. During the leeward turn, Part of this momentum given to the air, the dark blue arrow, is opposite to the wind direction. Therefore the wind loses momentum as the bird gains momentum. During the windward turn, part of the horizontal momentum given to the air is in the same direction as the wind, and the wind gains momentum as the bird loses momentum. So although the bird's change of ground speed is the same in both turns, the different rates of acceleration mean that in the shorter leeward turn, unit mass of air is given more acceleration compared with the longer windward turn in which unit mass of air is given less acceleration. Therefore, the wind loses more energy in the leeward turn than it gets back in the windward turn. So when the wind loses kinetic energy in the leeward turn, the bird gains energy in the form of ground velocity and extra height which is then expended to overcome drag. Overall, the bird itself does not gain energy because its average speed and height is constant. However, as mentioned earlier, the difference in kinetic energy is equivalent to the bird's drag losses. In effect, wind velocity has been converted to air turbulence in the wake of the bird. In order to demonstrate this exchange of momentum and energy, there has to be a common frame of reference relative to which we can measure the wind velocity and the bird velocity. That frame of reference is conveniently the ground. So this is how the albatross does dynamic soaring. The bird maintains average speed and height, balancing its drag losses with the energy of the wind. The key to dynamic soaring is for the albatross to control its airspeed and height by controlling its angle of bank and its rate of turn. The aerodynamic force, the angle of bank and the angle of drift, provide acceleration of ground speed. The rate of turn relative to the wind provides the acceleration of the head or tailwind component. The wind gradient and the ground effect reduce airspeed losses. The minimum usable wind speed as a proportion of the bird's airspeed depends on the minimum usable angle of drift. In 1883, Lord Rayleigh himself cast doubt on his own description of wind gradient soaring and said an explanation was badly wanted. So there you have it, better late than never. But don't try this with your own glider unless, like the albatross, you are prepared to get your feet wet. Thanks for watching this video and please leave a comment.